Good afternoon. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here in Rayburn this afternoon with all of you. Thank you for coming. I'm Nate Kazmarek, Director of the Federal Society's Article One Initiative. Based on the crowd we've gathered, I think it's safe to say that uh, congressional oversight is a topic that is on a lot of people's minds uh, heading into the 116th Congress. And we're looking forward to a great discussion with our panel today. Uh, first, a note of gratitude to Congressman Trey Gowdy and his oversight staff for their kindness in hosting us in this room today. Also, I want to thank my colleague Pete Bisbee and our Capitol Hill chapter uh, for their help in co-sponsoring this event. One more final plug for our Article I writing contest, uh, which is titled Ambition, Counteracting Ambition, Enduring Principle, or Failed Experiment. If you're interested, you still have time. The deadline is January 7th. Uh, complete contest rules and a description are available at fedsoc.org slash AI contest. Turning to our panel, uh, we are very grateful for our moderator and speakers. Uh, Amanda Neely is our moderator today, and she serves as general counsel to Senator Rob Portman and deputy chief counsel for Senate, uh, the Senate Permanent uh, Subcommittee on Investigations, or PSI. Uh, she has previously served in several Capitol Hill offices, including uh, as Oversight Counsel for the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, she clerked for then Chief Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, David Sintel. Uh, she has practiced law as an Associate Attorney at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. She holds degrees from Princeton University and Duke University School of Law. Next, we are pleased to have with us Professor John Yu. Professor Yu is the Emanuel Heller Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley and a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. His latest book, Striking Power, How Cyber, Robots, and Space Weapons Change the Rules for War, was published last year. Professor Yu has published numerous books and articles in top law journals. He regularly contributes, contributes to the editorial pages of the most prominent newspapers in the country. Professor Yu has served in all three branches of government. He was an official, I'm sorry, yes, he, was a, he, he served in the Office of Legal Counsel for the Department of Justice, uh, General Counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee, and a law clerk for Judge Lawrence Silberman of the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C., and for Justice Clarence Thomas. He is a graduate of Yale Law School and Harvard College. Last but not least, we have with us Steve Castor, who is the Chief Investigative Counsel for the House of Representatives Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. He has served on the committee staff here since 2005 and has participated in a wide variety of high-profile oversight investigations. Prior to his work for Congress, he practiced commercial litigation in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. He earned his law degree from George Washington University. Please note that following opening remarks and discussion, we will have audience Q&A. Um, and we will do it actually from the podium up here. It's, it's a logistical note, but I'll, I'll turn the podium this way. And if you could come up for your questions, the taxpayers haven't afforded the committee a handheld mic, I guess. So we will do our best. Um, but please think about the difficult questions you'd like to ask our great panel. With that, Ms. Neely, the panel is yours. Thanks so much, Nate, and thank you very much to the Article One Initiative for hosting us here today. We're really grateful to them, to the Federalist Society, to the Capitol Hill chapter, and for the Oversight and Government Reform Committee for making today possible. Um, I will preface any of my remarks with uh, I am a Capitol Hill staffer, so I have to offer that uh, any view I express here today is uh, my own. It is not that of necessarily that of Senator Portman or the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations or the U.S. Senate. Um, I am going to let my co-panelists here uh, offer their opening remarks, and then I have a number of tough questions and then hope to open the floor to all of you, um, who I'm sure will uh, have some that I have not thought of yet. So, John? Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thanks to the Federal Society uh, for inviting me. I'd like the record to show this is the first time I've appeared in the House without the threat of a subpoena. <laughs> So let the record show I showed up voluntarily this time. <laughs> um, it's also great to uh, be visiting from California, where my exit from the state has decreased the number of Republicans in the state by 75 percent. Um, and I just want to start saying I, I have a mixed view of this subject because I have worked in the 
both the executive branch and the Office of Legal Counsel, where I defended executive privilege claims. And when I was general counsel of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I worked on one of the uh, many Clinton administration investigations where I actually had the pleasure of signing a subpoena to force a recalcitrant witness to appear. So I, I, and I think the way I think of it is much more informed by just the framers view the separation of powers rather than modern case law, but we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, to start, I think it's worthwhile to start with the constitutional uh, text and its understanding. Of course, as you probably know, neither the main congressional or executive powers that are at issue in oversight are mentioned in the Constitution. There's no word oversight in the constitutional text. There were actually proposals at the Constitutional Convention to explicitly give Congress the power to punish people uh, who refused to comply with its investigations, and it was dropped. Um, and so the theory of congressional power has flowed mostly from practice, which began almost immediately, and some Supreme Court opinions that have occurred periodically, which talk about Congress's right to gather information necessary for it either to pass new legislation or evaluate uh, existing programs uh, or taxing and spending. Uh, and generally today, we don't really think about whether Congress is invoking one of its constitutional powers to which the oversight is ancillary. But I suspect, given the new configuration <clears throat> of the partisan balance between the House and the executive branch, you might start to see claims like that raised. The last time they were raised was when Congress, during the McCarthy period, conducted investigations into the, whether there were suspected con uh, communists in the government. And that's the last time, really, the Supreme Court talked about uh, where does the power of oversight really come from? And I suspect if we're going to have a lot of conflicts, like I, uh, as I think we will for the next two years, you're going to see that issue return for the first time uh, in a long time. But similarly, the executive power, as you know, the executive branch lawyer uh, in me uh, thinks that the major bulwark against oversight is executive privilege, uh, which, as you know, is not mentioned in the Constitution either but was inferred by the court in the Nixon case, the Watergate tapes case, but that case built on and summarized uh, decades of executive branch precedent. Uh, one interesting thing is that Nixon, if you read it closely, I think is much more limited than the meaning it's given in practice. So for example, those of you who work in Congress and have sought to get documents, information from the executive branch, you'll often hear the executive branch claim some kind of deliberation privilege. Right? That's not mentioned in Nixon at all. Right? Nixon talks about discussions directly between the president and officials and the need for the president to have confidentiality in his or her discussions. And the constitutional root of it is from the president's power over foreign affairs and law enforcement. If you remember, Nixon says executive privilege is at its height with law enforcement, foreign affairs, and national security. Then after that, there's just a sort of general privilege to discuss things privately in the interest of having candor in government policymaking, but that that can be overcome by the demands of other branches. And as you know, the Watergate tapes case, uh, it wasn't Congress that overcame executive privilege. It was the right of the defendants in the Watergate tapes case to put on a defense under the Sixth Amendment overcame executive privilege. We've never had a case at the Supreme Court, actually, about a claim of executive privilege up against a congressional claim of oversight. The best you have is uh, mostly district court decisions in DC and like one or two circuit court opinions that try their best to avoid the question. Uh, the third thing is uh, the courts. Where do they sit in all this? <clears throat> As I said, there's been no Supreme Court cases. The lower courts have done their best not to issue opinions in this area. The law is very vague. In part, that's because, uh, again, those of you who know this area, there's two ways that Congress has tried to enforce its rights. One is by seeking criminal contempt sanctions. And I think we saw with Attorney General Holder and the Fast and Furious investigation that can be easily frustrated by the executive branch because the attorney general can just order the US attorney in DC not to conduct a prosecution for criminal contempt. And that's where it was dropped. In the uh, Bush administration, the House went farther, the House committee went farther and sought civil contempt. 
And there's a lot of, I think, difficult legal issues surrounding that. For example, can a committee actually be the plaintiff and have standing to pursue the enforcement of a subpoena in a civil action? There's uh, Supreme Court cases about legislative standing, which are un which suggests it has to be the House as a whole that would have to vote. But what if the House has delegated the subpoena power to a committee? Is that enough? We don't know. The courts have not really explained, and the, the Supreme Court, of course, never heard such a case. Let me just uh, turn very quickly, uh, try to keep my remarks short, to what did the framers expect? I think the framers would not be surprised by all this. What they would be surprised about is the minimal, if any, court involvement. Uh, as you know, actually, uh, Nate stole my thunder by reading the, uh, was it the name of the writing competition, right? Uh, by the way, I, don't, I can't remember, but I don't know if those are taxable, but I'd like to enter the writing competition if money is awarded at the end. But right, ambition will counteract ambition. Right? That's the phrase from the key Federalist Papers explaining the separation of powers and how it would work. Right? If you remember, the Federalists, when it explains separation of powers, although acknowledging the term separation of powers does not appear in the Constitution either, the Federalist Papers say uh, they expect each branch to push its constitutional powers to the limits when they're fighting with each other, and they expect the ambition of each branch to counteract each other. And that process of conflict is what will produce individual liberty. So when people in Congress press their powers of oversight and subpoena, that is, in a way, the working out of the framers' design. And when the executive branch fights back with executive privilege, that too is the working out of the framers' design. Ultimately, as you know, mo almost all of these cases are we would think of as settled before they reach any really binding judicial uh, stage. And that's what the framers would want. Generally, I see, from practice, for what I've observed is Congress tends to win most of these. The thing that they would be very surprised about is the eagerness of both branches these days, I think, to go to the courts and, and think of the courts as the one providing a resolution to these fights. I think that's very much counter to what the framers expected. One last point, and then I'll stop, is I think there are some very interesting issues raised by this about uh, the Trump administration and the Mueller, uh, I mean, the Trump administration and the Mueller investigation. So I was just thinking about this uh, the last few days. Uh, there's some talk about uh, whether Mr. Mueller is going to refer or issue a report that would cause the House to start impeachment proceedings. I think this is a really interesting constitutional question. So suppose that uh, President Trump's uh, conduct that the House witches investigate occurred wholly before he took office as president, or as so far it appears to, or just suppose it does. Could the House actually run an impeachment proceeding that covered pre-presidential conduct. Right, we never, you know, we have no cases, of course. We have no Senate proceedings on something like this either. If that were true, could everyone who's a witness, including executive branch officials, refuse to appear in those hearings and refuse to comply with subpoenas for documents by saying the inquiry, and this is what goes back to my question, we've got to be conscious Congress has to have a constitutional basis <coughs> for the oversight. What if they say your impeachment proceeding itself is unconstitutional because it all involves conduct before the president was president? Even if it's related to getting the office, can a private citizen commit a high crime and misdemeanor within the impeachment clause? Or take a, the exact same issue comes up with Justice Kavanaugh. There's talk about people going to have hearings, whether Justice Kavanaugh might have committed perjury. And so we would have an impeachment proceeding again. Uh, the impeachment clause with regard to the judiciary talks about the judges holding office during good behavior. Could a justice be on bad behavior before they took office? Yeah, you know, I would think uh, not, but these questions have never been litigated. Uh, refusal to obey a subpoena would actually kick these cases into court maybe for the first time, and these are the first time we'd ever see any kind of discussion about these issues. But I think these are unique, actually these are unique issues that have never come up in our history before. But they're going to refocus us, again, on where I started, uh, where does Congress's constitutional power underpinning oversight come from in these unique situations raised by the, all the talk of impeachment? So thank you very much. I look forward to hearing uh, Steve and Amanda. And uh, thank you.
Thank you, and um, you can clap. <laughs> <laughs> um, this uh, <clears throat> Article One initiative is so important. The uh, the legislative branch seems to be um, losing its ability to, to keep the best people. Uh, I know on our staff, everybody has an allure of, of, of you know, going to the executive branch. Um, there's an allure to going to the Senate. Um, and the House still needs um, good people. And the uh, next Congress is going to be one of the most interesting Congresses uh, we've seen in some time. Um, with the Democrats uh, taking the House uh, during a first term of, of a presidential administration of a different party. Uh, the last time the Democrats uh, took the House in 2006, we were dealing with the last two years of the Bush administration. Uh, last two years of a presidential uh, administration are a lot less, um, you know, a lot, lot less energy to do to do the oversight work, uh, and that's not the case now. There is uh, enormous energy, um, and it's going to be fascinating to see how uh, things unfold in the, in the next year. Um, one of the tricky things about, uh, you know, every single O&I matter, oversight investigative matter, is different. And it's, it's never uh, the same um, because of, you know, there's always environmental factors that come into play. Um, you know, whether the oversight and investigative matter has the support of the speaker, whether the oversight and investigative matter um, has uh, the support of the whole uh, conference or in, in, you know, with the Democrats, the, the, their caucus. Um, and I think we've already seen uh, some questions about whether um, whether the Democrats in the in the majority are going to be eager to to push impeachment, or or tap the brakes and, and try to try to go slow and methodical, um, I think there's questions of are they going to try to do too much? Um, you know, oversight and investigative work is only done effectively when it's focused. And you know, any given committee chairman can only spend time on two or three matters at once. Uh, you, you can't drop 160 different uh, um, investigations and expect to be able to follow the facts for all of them. Um, and so the, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, questions of um, where their energy is going to be. Um, you know, one of the tricky things about any oversight investigative matter is that there really are very few rules to, to guide. Um, if you're litigating in federal court, you have the, the federal discovery rules. If you don't produce a document or uh, if a prosecutor doesn't, um, you know, turn over exculpatory, uh, exculpatory information to a criminal defendant, there are very serious consequences. We saw it with Ted Stevens' case. The prosecutors paid a very heavy price uh, for failing to turn over uh, material to the prosecutor or to the defense team, and. Um, you know, likewise, in a, in, in a civil litigation matter, the failure to turn over documents responsive to a, a discovery request uh, carries a big, a big ticket uh, penalty. Um, when it comes to congressional oversight, there is no judge. There is no uh, federal rules of civil procedure. Uh, the House rules don't necessarily guide a discovery dispute. Um, the Constitution doesn't necessarily guide a discovery dispute. And so um, some of the usual tools that are used in, in federal courts, such as privilege logs, um, aren't, aren't applicable. The, the executive branch is um, extremely reluctant to offer a privilege log. Um, and you, you really only get privilege logs if a, if a judge orders it. Um, and so... Um, The, the ability to, to, to force the issue um, requires um, a combination of, of, of media attention, of, of public awareness, and the ability to, um, 
you know, achieve investigative successes without the assistance of the executive branch. Some of the most important investigative matters that we have worked on in the last, in the last ten, 10 years have seen whistleblowers provide key information, have seen um, investigative facts uh, found um, without the traditional uh, method of asking for documents, receiving documents, and, and, and going from there. So um, you know, sometimes it takes cooperation from the uh, executive branch, and it's unlikely that will uh, happen uh, next year. Um, the, um, well, one other thing I'll, I'll sort of, uh, to, to wrap up, the, the, the absence of, of a real robust authorizing and appropriation cycle has, has disadvantaged the House. The, the loss of uh, the earmark tool ha has also, uh, in my view, disadvantaged the House from you know, working its will in, in when it comes to oversight and investigative work. Um, you know, these spending bills tend to get wrapped up at the last minute, they tend to be um, continuing resolutions, um, and the absence of that um, regular order, so to speak, uh, hurts the House because the House doesn't have the the ability to uh, lean on an agency and say, "If you don't, you know, cooperate with this investigative uh, matter or this document request, we're gonna we're gonna uh, reduce your budget." Uh, that's just not a realistic threat uh, anymore. So um, I think that's pretty much it for my opening remarks, and thanks for uh, putting together this important presentation. Great. Thanks to you both, and for Steve as well. So I'd like to start off by uh, looking at a high-level issue and one that I'm really interested in. Um, I'm an Article One person. I've um, been on the Hill for a while and have not been in the executive branch. And so I have always argued that uh, Congress has an obligation to do rigorous oversight of any administration, including a Republican Congress uh, of a Republican administration. Um, in general terms, high level, what is the obligation of Congress to do rigorous oversight of any administration? What is the obligation of a Republican-held Senate to do oversight of a Republican administration, particularly when there is a Democrat held house that will be doing very vigorous oversight. Um, how, how do you balance that? You know, both, both the House and the Senate have a duty to, to do oversight. Uh, the oversight uh, must be legitimate. The oversight must, um, you know, aim to improve the, you know, effectiveness of the operations of the federal government. Um, it's it's not a very productive use of oversight resources to, um, you know, investigate uh, steroid use in baseball. Um, you, you know, when when Chairman Waxman uh, had the committee, we we spent a lot of time, despite the the you know perceived interest in in conducting uh, oversight of the Bush administration, Bush forty three, uh, we spent a lot of time investigating Roger Clemens. Um, that that matter went on and on, and so um, you know it certainly does beg the question: um, why? Well, uh, I mean, that's a good question. Given the, uh, as you said, as you noticed, the partisan alignment is changing. So one way to think about it is: who would the House? controlled by Democrats, the Senate controlled by Republicans, and the White House controlled by Republicans, who would be their common enemy? And that would be the administrative state, right? The, if you think about one key function, I mean, there's going to be a huge temptation for Democrats in the House to investigate the White House. But the, I think the better area to investigate, which actually is of benefit to the political leadership in the executive branch, is to look at the way the administrative state is exercising the vast delegations of authority that Congress has given it over the last 80 years. So if uh, those, those delegations are so vague, right, keep the air clean, right, consistent with economic growth, that it's hard to say, 
exactly, even in the executive branch, it's hard to say exactly what you're doing is really consistent with Congress's intentions when they pass a law or even Congress's intentions now. How else do you, you know, make sure that the administrative state is acting in alignment with what Congress wants than through oversight hearings? And then it's actually of a benefit, I think, uh, in the long term to the uh, political elected leadership in the executive branch, because as many people have observed in the scholarship, the president and even the cabinet heads may not really know what's going on in their own agencies. And uh, they talk about congressional hearings. The scholars say congressional hearings are like burglar alarms. They often, the congressional hearings are, will bring to light things that the political leadership of those agencies themselves want to fix, but they can't get the information to flow up their own agencies because bureaucracies tend to protect each other. So it seems to me that no, no matter whether you're House or Senate, I would focus the attention on this vast administrative state with a million employees, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in discretionary spending, and focus it on that. I think that redounds to the benefit. And, and I think this also makes sense of the constitutional structure, because even though I talked about that alignment of ambition, counteracting ambition, the administrative state tends to undermine the incentives the framers set up for the branches to fight with each other and observe each other. They're, they've become, I think, actually more the opponent of constitutional government than anything the other three branches are doing. Well, picking up on that, you've been on the receiving end of document requests and subpoenas. And I have a feeling, um, based on what I saw from the Obama administration and currently from the Trump administration, uh, there's been a real reluctance to produce documents, to provide information. And I think that might, um, that reluctance will only increase uh, as the Democrats uh, work through their initial oversight requests. Um, what is the best way, what is your advice to Hill congressional investigators to how to, to work with the administration to get the information they need to do diligent oversight of the Ministry of State? I think it's a, also a very good question, Amanda. I, th I, th I when I uh, was working in the executive branch, I noticed that the claims of executive privilege were far broader than what the Supreme Court had actually described in Nixon. Uh, and Congress often let them get away with it. So you would see these claims, again, this deliberation privilege. There's no deliberation privilege mentioned in Nixon between anyone other than the president and his communications with his uh, staff, cabinet officers, or suppose a president you know, this president wanted to reach down and talk to someone in the bureaucracies. Nixon would uh, often do. But there's executive privilege. Under, as, you, as If you read about in Nixon, executive privilege does not exist between a cabinet member and an assistant secretary. But the executive branch commonly raises that as a defense. What, that t what those claims are is taking the theory of Nixon, the idea that the Constitution wants us to have uh, secrecy and discussions of policymaking before they're reached, so as to have open and candid policy, uh, you know, policy options considered. That might be a good idea for governance, but that is not in the case law. And it would be harder to claim that it comes out of the executive power if that's what comes from the president. But by practice, I, I just uh, one example, um, during the uh, uh, McCarthy era, when there were a lot of investigations going on, presidents did make these kinds of claims. President Eisenhower, actually ordered during the McCarthy period that no member of the executive branch could testify before Congress without the permission of the White House. And claimed that, and he said in public, I think in a press conference, that's because of executive privilege. But that's so, it's arisen almost by a kind of a practice between the Congress and the executive branch, but it's not with that, it doesn't yet have any kind of constitutional foundation. So I would, that's where I would, if I were a congressional investigator, that's where I would fight the hardest is not to, Although the political payoffs probably get, oh, did Trump say this to um, whoever the rotating chief of staff position holder is going to be? I'm available, by the way. I, I was going to say I was on my way to interview, but that's not true. <laughs> um, right? That's where the political, but that is the constitutionally strongest position for the president, for executive privilege. The weakest one is, again, the workings of the administrative state, all those hundreds of assistant secretaries out there talking with people. That, to, right now, that's not protected by executive privilege. So following up on that, and I think, Steve, you probably will have some strong opinions on this. You probably both will. Um, I've been on this side of the document fights, um, and it can be tedious, arduous, long. And at the end of the day, in some cases, 
the administration gets to the point where you send a subpoena, they say, forget it. You refer it over to the Department of Ju Contempt, criminal contempt over to the Department of Justice. And DOJ says, we're not going to prosecute that, even though the statute regarding that says that it shall be the duty of the U.S. attorney to take that to a grand jury. And we'll come back to that. But is the solution then, you had mentioned two ways to compel inherent, uh, sorry, civil contempt and criminal contempt. Do we then have to move back to inherent contempt? It hasn't been used since the Teapot Dome scandal under Harding in the 1920s. But Congress, in fact, does have the power to arrest somebody and hold them in prison. I think during the Teapot Dome, they were being held at one of the very nice hotels down the street. Um, might not be so bad, but um, as a compulsory mechanism, not as a punitive mechanism. Um, is that what it's going to take to get the administration to cooperate with those sorts of requests? Should we think about resurrecting inherent contempt? We probably should, but we probably won't. Um, it's too jarring, I think, to people to have, um, you know, a member of the House or Senate, you know, or go arrest somebody. Um, and there's a question of whether, you know, a habeas petition would be filed and all of a sudden you'd be back in federal court. Um, but the courts do require an accommodations process. And, you know, any congressional investigation usually starts broad. Subpoenas are written in a way that, um, you know, an executive branch agency is able to say, this is too broad and it's going to take us weeks and weeks and weeks to, to get to the heart of the matter. And congressional committees do have an obligation to identify what their priorities are, to signal what they're looking into. Um, and if documents exist, they ought to be able to identify them with particularity, if they can. Um, if you can't identify documents with particularity, um, are you sure they exist? Um, and so, you, you know, enforcing a congressional subpoena through the contempt process is, is there, it's available, but it's so rare. I mean, it happens maybe once a Congress. Um, and, you know, congressional committees new, need to do uh, a better job at, at you know, solving their problems without contempt. Uh, and there are plenty of ways to, to solve your, your O&I problems without um, the th even the threat of contempt. Um, so... I this is it's an interesting question we faced when I was working on the Hill and then in the executive branch, too. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, I think the last major time this was litigated was when the uh, House Democrat Oversight Committee uh, held Harriet Myers, who was the White House counsel, and Josh Bolton, the chief of staff, in contempt uh, for refusing to comply with requests uh, for information relating to the firing of, uh, I think, eight U.S. attorneys. Um, it's one of the weird situations that Trump will never have because he would fire all of them simultaneously <laughs> rather than just picking eight out to be fired. And it's interesting. Uh, so the House went to uh, enforce a subpoena by a civil proceeding, and the district court in Washington here actually said it had the jurisdiction to hear the case and to enforce a subpoena. And it's very interesting why. One thing the court said was the reason we're going to do this is so that the Congress will not use inherent contempt because inherent contempt would be so destructive. The, and they said the idea of congressional officers trying to physically apprehend cabinet members would be so disgraceful for the country that this judge instead would actually go with civil contempt as a hearing. But this, that, the, 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 this part of passage of the opinion is very interesting because it went through the things that Congress would have to do, uh, not just find a prison. I mean, there used to be a prison actually in Congress uh, in the Capitol building. You visited. I think, was there on, a tour? I think it was on the House side. I think oh, there, was on the there House were rumors side? of it. Yeah. I was hoping it was around where the Supreme Court used to sit under the Capitol Dome, so just for a quick transfer of people. <laughs> um, there's been, who's going to actually do the apprehending? So like, is the sergeant of arms of the House, is, is there a physical fitness requirement? Because it doesn't look like it from the State of the Union addresses I've seen. Um, unlike the Canadian Parliament, I don't know if you remember, the Canadian Parliament had a terrorist run in, and the Canadian Parliament sergeant of arms has a mace, and he hit him in the head with the mace and stopped him. I mean, that guy was physically fit. <laughs> 
I'm so sorry to do this. Any Hill staffer will know what's going on. There is a small fire drill, and I have to step out for just a moment. Thanks. I will moderate now. <laughs> I will finally assume control of all positions, as I always wish to. Um, <laughs> But I actually agree with Steve, the, and I hadn't thought about that point you made. It was really interesting. Um, someone could write a whole larvae article about this because no one's said a, talked about this in scholarship. Is as earmarks have declined, and as you've gone to the omnibus rush at the end, continuing resolution system, the traditional way to enforce their demands for information was cut off funds, throw in riders, not confirm people, threaten to pass. If you don't have that as a tool, and you don't have contempt, then why would an executive branch? officer listen to you. And the, I mean, often the answer is in, a, in an oversight investigative um, situation, you, you get information, uh, the Congress gets the information they want when the alternative is worse. Uh, when you start talking about bringing cabinet secretaries in for hearings, when you start talking about bringing witnesses in for depositions to better understand the um, the universe of documents in play and how the search uh, methodology is being employed, um, those types of maneuvers um, are are not met uh, with with smiles uh, in the executive branch. Um, and so, you know, often the, the law of oversight is, is you know, you, you get something when the alternative is worse. Okay, so I'm going to read Amanda's questions. <laughs> this is great. So uh, she has another question for you. All the hard ones for me I'm going to not ask. But <laughs> for you, she says, what are the opportunities for bipartisan oversight in the upcoming, I mean, are there any, uh, what might they be, where do you expect to see cooperation and then also what uh, cautions would you give against about mistakes that you might see will occur with oversight in the next Congress? There's always opportunities for bipartisan oversight in, in you know, in and around Washington. There's, there's Republicans and Democrats with interest in, in Metro, in the operation of the District of Columbia. Um, and when it comes to DOD oversight, when it comes to oversight of the State Department, there is always going to be um, bipartisan opportunities to to uh, look into things. Okay, now I'm going to ask myself a question to which I know the answer already. No. Uh, so the question she had for me, this is actually a very interesting question, is uh, we tend to focus a lot on executive privilege claims, but actually the executive branch often invokes a lot of different privileges when they resist congressional oversight, uh, such as the right against self-incrimination, uh, which you could see a lot of people maybe claiming in any kind of impeachment proceeding. Plus, you also see attorney-client privilege often invoked. I haven't seen priest penitent or husband spouse yet, but I'm sure historically someone has made those claims before Congress. And so Amanda's question is, you know, are these valid privileges? Uh, does Congress have to recognize them? What have the courts said? So the interesting thing is that in those very early 19th century uh, congressional investigations, Congress uh, refused to recognize the attorney-client privilege. There were people in these inherent contempt cases that Steve's referring to. If you go back and look, some of these uh, defendants, if, they were, if that's what they were, actually invoked their right to counsel. And sometimes Congress refused. They would not grant them. And in part, they, I think, legitimately could say the right to counsel in the Sixth Amendment is guaranteed to us for criminal proceedings before the judiciary. Right? There's no discussion of them applying to right, Congress and its oversight proceedings. So there's a constitutional argument which people have made over the years that none of the privileges that we recognize in the litigation process apply to Congress. But you'll often hear, and when, uh, when I worked on oversight uh, of the Clinton administration, we chose as a matter of good practice and policy to recognize all of those privileges in our investigations so as not to spark any kind of constitutional fight that would go to the courts, and also uh, not to put uh, people in the position of having to think about, right, do I have attorney-client privilege now, but not now, uh, when you're you know, just under, you know, just going about your daily private lives. Uh, so, uh, but the constitutional question is still there, and again, never been resolved by the Supreme Court. One of the, the challenges, and I think the executive branch would do themselves a favor if they, if they cut some of the 
uh, objections to straightforward oversight uh, questions. You know, when we were, when we conduct, anytime we conduct oversight or an investigation involving the Justice Department, they always tell us that, you know, it's law enforcement sensitive. You can't have it. it involves an ongoing criminal investigation. You can't have it. This involves a line prosecutor. A line prosecutor. You can't talk to him. Uh, the Privacy Act doesn't allow us to give you, Congress, information about anybody below an SES level. Um, the Privacy Act does not apply to Congress. Um, you know, we can't give you information because uh, other agencies have equities. We can't give you information because there are, um, you know, it's not classified, but it's, it's uh, sensitive. And that's just a made-up uh, designation. And, the, the, you know, you can, you, we can talk all day about the reasons executive branch agencies, you know, want to withhold information from Congress, and it's, it's not helpful. Um, it would be in everyone's interest if there was a meeting of the minds, meeting halfway, some accommodation, cooperation on a, a particular matter. Um, you know, if that if that did happen, it would reorient people towards getting these matters over with as quickly as possible. Um, when you won't give Congress Privacy Act information, that starts a long, um, you know, a long period of impasse, mm -hmm. and and it's it's not it's not helpful. The, these most of these oversight matters can be conducted in three months. You know, a, a congressional committee is not a prosecutor, and we're not an IG. Um, we, we can ask the questions we need to ask. We can get the documents we need to get, and we can have hearings, and we can move on. Um, and that really is in everyone's best interest. But um, there's so much uh, fear of, uh, of, of finding the smoking gun, of, of embarrassing somebody, that, that these matters that ought to take three months end up taking um, six months and a year. <coughs> Okay, so there, let's just one last question and then we'll go to audience questions. Uh, so this one's for Steve also, and then I'll think of what I would say too. So um, is there any particular story you would like to share of a particular mistake or misstep you made in an investigation so as to warn people against making it, or some particularly great victory or tricky thing you did that actually advanced your investigatory powers that you also want to share? I think the biggest mistakes that are made with congressional investigations are, are leading too much with the predicate. You know, before a congressional committee requests information, you have to establish that there's some series of facts worth investigating. But sometimes committee chairmen go a little too far and allege too much and reveal that they are not fair-minded, reveal that they have already, um, you know, convicted um, the, the cabinet secretary that they're looking into or the agency official. And when you're in the minority, one of the, the best tools you have is to just demonstrate that the investigator is not fair-minded uh, and is not willing to keep an open mind. Uh, and once an investigator is revealed to be biased, it's hard to trust the integrity of the process. So, so one thing that I recall uh, about doing a uh, whitewater investigation, uh, and it's going to recur these next two years, is the relationship between congressional oversight and criminal prosecutions. And one thing I've noticed in Congress, uh, compared to I think what the framers expected, is you see Congress defer quite a bit to criminal prosecutors. Uh, so for example, grants of immunity uh, are going to be a big issue, plea bargains are going to be, does Congress have to recognize and go along with the terms of immunity grants or plea bargains by a special, the special counsel or by the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York? Um, so I, I actually thought, when, and, and, that goes, and I think that's because uh, partisans on both sides want to see the enemy in jail, right? But that's not really what the framers expected as the main tool to police the separation of powers. Again, I think they expected the two branches to fight a lot, in fact, all the time, 
but I didn't think they expected to see this kind of criminalization of politics that we're living through right now. But the odd effect is that as criminalization has grown, it creates an incentive for people on the Hill to pull back from their oversight and kind of expect prosecutors to do the job, which is hard when the president is the chief prosecutor in the country, ultimately, and can constrain prosecutors in what they do. Uh, so I, I think that's something I think to be very cautious. But I think that was a mistake that the uh, Congress made in the Whitewater investigations by deferring too much to the independent counsel then. It may be one that they make ag again. Nate? So we definitely have time for Q&A. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question from the podium, then please line up here. Uh, if you're on the other side of the room and you can't make it over, please do just ask your question. We'll ask our panelists to re repeat uh, the question. <laughs> Hey, <clears throat> I'm Mike Doherty. Um, as Steve might know, I've been through an investigation, and I'm not an attorney. I'm the CEO of LabMD, and there's two things that come to mind with my experience of this, and one is anarchy, and the other is um, <clears throat> a lack of accountability. And what I witnessed with an oversight committee that was actually willing to go outside the box and deal in facts instead of politics was an appalling, what I also see in a bigger system, bigger stage right now with this current administration, <clears throat> not about the administration, but the the left's response to it is just any type of molasses mud slinging is fine. So that while we're talking about inside the system procedures, they're playing just wrestling matches. And really, it's, it doesn't matter what it is. It's just slow it down, slow it down. So that when we had physical evidence that would then be suppressed by the minority attorneys so that we couldn't get immunity for people or all these games that go on that are truly shocking. It doesn't get out. And then Oversight does a terrific job of putting a report out. I mean, an amazing 93-page report. And no one will read it. The press won't read it. There's such an uphill battle of credibility. People don't understand. The whole game of circle and confuse is, is appalling to me. And it's, I think, an, a greater issue than talking about what we're going through here. Because it's, it's um, persecution through mudslinging and process rather than dealing with the process. I don't know what you've talked about that. So I, I think this calls for an observation rather than an answer. Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You didn't ask a yes, question. sorry. So, Steve. Well, Steve knows about that. The question of immunity is tricky because it requires two-thirds vote of the committee. Uh, so it has to be a remarkably uh, outrageous set of facts that compels two-thirds of the committee to, to vote in favor of an uh, immunity deal. Uh, but it also... Um, well, Justice granted it in a week after that. But <laughs> so he got immunity. The, the point isn't the specifics of that, that investigation. If I, if my question really is about all these tactics you see that are outside. You, you go through these things, and I've, I've witnessed them. So I wanted you to yes. talk about that. That's my question okay. more about all these other tactics. OK. Oh, well, OK, I'll just say a word or two about, I think the part that's affected by the uh, changing uh, nature of the media landscape in that, uh, so when I worked on the Whitewater investigation, uh, we were really hopeful that any kind of information that we revealed in the hearings would get on CNN. Right, like if we would measure success almost like we would watch the evening news to see whether CNN or one of the major news networks carried a story about the Whitewater hearings that day and had a clip. So I think in this media age, that doesn't matter anymore. So in the sense that you're worried about, uh, I think rightly so, about uh, for all the oversight and the fighting, if the public doesn't know about it, what good does it do? I actually think the explosion of outlets of media and ways of getting information is actually much more helpful and more likely than that people will see things from oversight hearings, not just watching C-SPAN, but you have a lot more, sorry, a lot more uh, journalists in a way, bloggers, everyone covering and feeding information out of these hearings. So it's less likely that uh, sort of oligopolic media control is going to dictate what message comes out of oversight than it used to, say, just as recently as 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Yeah, media coverage does provide an important coefficient to uh, helping you get to the bottom of an investigative matter. With Fast and Furious, if we didn't have CBS News reporting on it, if we didn't have Wall Street Journal uh, and other mainstream news outlets uh, reporting on the evils uh, of Fast and Furious and, and letting all these firearms uh, get into the hands of bad guys intentionally, uh, we never would have been able to get the Justice Department to cooperate with us. Now, the flip side of that is how much how much media attention or is a good thing uh, if you if you 
if too much information gets out in the media before you complete your investigation, you can be accused of not being fair-minded. You can be accused of not doing a a responsible, fact-centric um, um, investigation. Next question. Yes, right here. Professor Yu, you uh, uh, referred briefly to the deliberative privilege in the, uh, um, in the administrative agencies, which, by the way, are <clears throat> now generally controlled by a majority of conservatives, um, and the, now with the uh, change in, in, in the House, the, they're going to be responding. Um, so it's, it's not the, the, what, what, you, what you usually think of. Uh, but the, it, it's, it's widely regarded in the administrative agencies that there is a deliberative privilege. And uh, I think you spoke to the, to the contrary briefly before, and I'd like you to elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah if I would, uh, thanks for that question. If I were to point to a kind of uh, shield the executive branch often uses, it's more the deliberative privilege than anything else without any root in the Constitution, as far as I can tell, as, be, as has been elaborated by the courts. So uh, again, if you read the executive privilege Supreme Court cases, they don't mention a deliberative privilege at all. They don't mention a privilege attaching to anyone other than the president in person. Uh, so I, I, that's, uh, that was really struck me when I worked on both sides of this issue, is the, this this idea is mushroomed into becoming actually, I think, the major source for executive branch refusals to cooperate with Congress. Um, part of it is also um, you're not going to have case law because these things are, as we just for many reasons, don't get litigated. Now, if you were to uh, pull back and say, putting aside what courts have said, is there actually an executive privilege of deliberation that you would expect to see, say, if you asked, I don't know, George Washington or Alexander Madison? You know, you don't see anything quite like that discussed. So I'll just the I'll talk about the first two claims of executive privilege that were made uh, in the the beginning of the founding of the country. The first one, famously, is not really executive privilege. It was George Washington's refusal to provide the House with the negotiating records over the Jay Treaty, which was a 1795 treaty with Great Britain. The interesting thing is he didn't claim executive privilege, although everyone points to this precedent. Uh, as the example, he actually provided all the records to the Senate. But what he said was the Senate is the one that has the advice and consent power. The House has no power over treaties, so I don't have to give it to the House, but I will give it to the Senate. The, the second claim of executive privilege comes closer to this is by Thomas Jefferson. This is the first real claim, executive privilege, is by Thomas Jefferson during the Aaron Burr prosecution. Uh, when This is a great case. Chief Justice John Marshall was the trial judge. Aaron Burr, who was just vice president, also shot Hamilton because it happened in a Broadway musical, so it must be true. So <laughs> he shot Alexander, uh, Hamilton. He then tried to raise a rebellion in the Louisiana Territory and become king of Louisiana. One of our mistakes as a, his, as a country is that we didn't let him do it, but nonetheless. <laughs> we came, and there was a prosecution. And it's very interesting. Burr claimed the right to call Jefferson as a witness in his defense at the trial. And so John Marshall issued an order saying, Jefferson, I want you to produce any documents of letters you have with Burr, and I want you to appear at trial. And Jefferson refused. That's the first claim of executive privilege. But that one attached to Jefferson made the claim he himself and the body of the president couldn't be dragged all over the country by, at the whim of every district. It was never a claim about my deliberations in the executive branch. This is really, I, I actually, I haven't looked at, I, I think it traces back just to the creation of the administrative state. And there being so many people working the administrative agencies who are not covered by executive privilege, but they feel some need to protect their discussions and not be embarrassed afterwards. That the executive branch has created this privilege. It does, it, it does not exist in court, right? If you had a criminal prosecution, you couldn't say, I have a deliberative right, privilege and I refuse to testify in a criminal case. So it's really just a creation of the executive branch, but Congress repeatedly recognizes it and lives by it. That's what I think is surprising. That's what I think is surprising. It's almost like adverse procession in property law. After enough decades, Congress has given up on it so often. It's hard to, it's, it has a real life to it now. 
And from a practical standpoint, if an executive agency says, we're not giving you these documents because they're deliberative, what does the Congress do? You sue for it? Um, and, you know, even, even if, for the sake of argument, if you're going to entertain the concept of a deliberative process privilege, shouldn't, ha shouldn't it have the same um, relative uh, analysis as the presidential communications privilege? The presidential communications privilege deals with documents prepared for the president for presidential decision-making. Um, you know, if that's the case, and you're talking about the Justice Department, um, if the Justice, you know, if the holder Justice Department is going to withhold documents from Congress, shouldn't it demonstrate that these are documents prepared for the Attorney General for a decision that was ultimately made? Um, and that's not the way deliberative process is asserted. The way deliberative process is asserted is there are documents which are deliberative, and according to long-standing departmental interests, we're not giving them to you. And we don't get a, a log of those documents. We don't get a, any, any type of itemization. Uh, and there's virtually no way to evaluate whether the claim is legitimate. Uh, in the Fast and Furious litigation, <coughs> when the judge ordered the Justice Department to prepare a privilege log, she called it a detailed list, that exercise of going through communication by communication yielded us 60,000 documents. Uh, there were 60,000 documents that the Justice Department could not arguably uh, put on their privilege log. Um, and, and so that just goes to show that when the rubber meets the road, a lot of these deliberative uh, process claims can't, you know, don't withstand scrutiny. Sure. Uh, uh, Bob Carlson. Uh, just a question on the upcoming subpoena frenzy that's been uh, promised by a couple of the incoming chairmen in the House committee. And, you know, what can be done? A, perhaps temper that more reasonably. And B, what are your thoughts on what the executive should say in the face of uh, that? Let me repeat the question was, uh, if a frenzy of subpoenas does come out of the House uh, when the new House comes into session in January, uh, one, is there a way to temper excessive use of the subpoena? And two, what would the executive branch do in the face of these subpoenas? We, we encourage the executive branch to adopt, adopt a posture of cooperation, adopt an open mind. Um, there are always ways to accommodate Congress's interest, and there are always ways to, to meet in the middle. Uh, you know, asking a committee to identify um, its priority documents without waiving any, you know, without waiving any, um, you know, larger request. If, if a congressional committee can articulate clearly and concisely with particularity what it's looking into and why, then that puts an agency in a position where it can engage. Um, and that is really how you get, you know, that's how the accommodations process works. Um, the, the trouble is when you know, Congress refuses to move off of some broad um, request that, you know, becomes unworkable at the executive branch. I mean, oftentimes in Congress, and, you know, we're, we're guilty of it um, now, we, we fail to appreciate what it takes for the executive branch to identify all the documents we've asked. We fail to appreciate that the next step after they identify responsive documents is reviewing them. And several layers of review, and, and granted all agencies take that review to ridiculous extremes, but you know it is reasonable to expect that before an agency is going to turn something over to Congress, it wants to know what it's it's producing. Um, and if the document requests stay broad and there's no ability to narrow it down and identify priorities and signal what you're looking for, then there's no way to, there's no way to meet in the middle. The only ad addition I would make the executive branch perspective would be you often hear it said, I think having worked inside the Justice Department, I saw that was uh, you're, you Congress are asking for so many sort of unlimited 
essentially uh, lists of subjects and documents. We don't have the time or the staff to comply with them. It's Congress should has to give us more money and positions actually to spend reviewing all the document requests. And that, so it's not deliberate delay, but if there is a sort of frenzy of subpoenas, there's no way for the executive branch actually to physically comply with all of them immediately, right? At the same time, they have to be prioritized. And so you'll see, right, that's what the executive branch will do, aside from claiming all the privileges, just say we can't consume all the resources of the department. And so you'll see the political argument is made. You've asked for 150 things and 300 letters, and we have... 10 people working around the clock, spending millions of dollars complying. Is that a good use of taxpayers' dollars? But that conceals just that it is consumptive of resources to have to comply with excessive oversight requests. And the executive branch can always agree to produce documents on a rolling basis and to take the adversarial nature, the adversarial bite out of these uh, disputes. Um, You know, a, a pledge to cooperate and a rolling production. Um, is a good way to, to get the ball rolling. This is what we call in the profession a ringer. <laughs> Go ahead. I may have thought, I may have thought about this a little bit. Um, but I think what I'm hearing and it's kind of reaffirming my own experience has been it's going to be, it's going to be very difficult, right? Um, there's lots of arguments that the administration can make to not turn over documents. Um, the Democratic House is going to be very insistent upon it. Um, I, my personal view is us ultimately the media is going to be the arbiter of um, what matters, really, you know, what, what issues really matter, and therefore which ones um, does the Trump administration feel pressure to respond to. But, but that, I, I'm curious about your opinion there. But my question is actually, how much should um, K Street be worried? How much should industry be worried about how they're going to get roped in? Um, as they might actually have the evidence or the documentation that um, could build the theory, prove the theory, be the smoking gun, um, but they are under a different burden um, and have much less tools um, than the Trump administration will have in order to resist those document requests. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are there. Um, let me maybe address the media question, and you want to take the case tree question. So with the media question, I was just thinking I had the weird um, juxtaposition the last... 12 hours, I was both on Fox News and NPR. I bet there's no one else who can make the claim, have been on both, willingly have been on Fox and NPR in the same 12 hour period. So I think I have a pretty good sense of how the media, right, prioritizes stories, thinks about what to cover um, in this new age. And so if I were you, I would spend a lot more time packaging exactly as if you were writing the story yourself and presenting a narrative with, you know, heroes and, you know, you have something that's digestible. I think uh, earlier on, at least what I witnessed is that um, committees would throw all the information out there and then kind of expect the media to actually figure out what the important and unimportant parts of the story are. And uh, I think it's just like being a trial lawyer, where right? You're telling a story to a jury and you want to lay it out so that you just don't give all the evidence to a jury without a roadmap of how to think about it. Um, and I think that's something committees, on the other hand, the executive branch for sure will be out there presenting its own narrative on the information. And right, obviously, you see the executive branch, I mean, this is what we did, right? You would deliver the documents to Congress and publicly release them and put out your story before congressional staff have a time to have time to analyze the documents, even, um, so I think it's. But I think this is a skill that lawyers, in particular, uh, have, and it might be worthwhile to bring on staff people who are kind of like trial attorneys who are used to appearing before juries because it's very. I think it's a very similar skill set. Just to follow up on the media question, if you know, there's certain news outlets if they determine, and their reporting is that the the committee chairman in question is not fair. The committee chairman in question is biased. The committee chair in question has already made up his or her mind. And investigative, um, you know, might be over right there because it may be in the executive's interest to cooperate not at all. Uh, And that might might fan the types of stories from the types of media outlets that the administration is is favorable to and, and, and consumes. And so... The, the, with the proliferation of, of media organizations and different modes and social, social media, 
Um, you know, it may work to stymie efforts to get to the bottom of things through, through congressional, um, you know, hearings. You know, as far as K Street is concerned, there is unquestionably an interest um, to examine, you know, certain topics. So pharmaceutical companies are probably on notice right now. Um, and the, the banking industry, um, there's all sorts of, you know, requirements in the banking industry to keep records. And so to the extent a congressional committee uh, wants to get to the bottom of something that involves a financial transaction, um, most of those records are knowable uh, because they're required, you know, they're required by law to keep certain information. And congressional committees that go after uh, financial institutions um, are going to be more successful than the congressional committees that, that spend their time um, zeroing in on, um, you know, run-of-the-mill uh, document uh, requests with the agencies. Just on, on the K Street point, just a, a just one small. I I have noticed there's been a very uh, a strong upgrade in capabilities in private industry to deal with investigations oversight, but. Happily, the one area they have not upgraded, ironically, is the high-tech industry. So they're constantly making series of errors in how to deal with oversight to their own harm, right? Um, and this goes, this is just inherent, I think, in the high-tech industry where I live, where they just have, they um, disdain politics. They're, on the one hand, on the other hand, they're very partisan in one direction in their personal beliefs, which just reminds me of a story uh, I was kind of around when the first uh, hearing started into Microsoft back in the mid to late 90s. And I still remember uh, there was a document Microsoft had to hand over, and they did it in Microsoft Word. And they had done track changes, and they didn't do erase track changes. So you could just turn it on. And they were saying stuff, comments like, that Senator so-and-so, such an idiot. I can't believe we have to answer these questions, right? So it was like using their Microsoft's own function to figure out what they were saying to each other. And it was horribly embarrassing for them and cost them political points. You still see them making these kind of you know, silly, uh, you know, like rookie errors, even today. Um, so, right, there's a hearing on Google going on right now, which you should all be watching with great amusement and anticipation. But I bet this is going to continue with this particular industry for a while. They just don't know how to deal with Washington effectively. Document requests to, to, to um, companies tend to be evaluated under the, um, under the model of the, of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, you know, the stakes are very high for a company. If they uh, get burned, you know, get burned publicly for, for, for bad behavior, I mean, it can affect their stock price. It can affect a lot of, um, you know, a lot of things that just aren't in play uh, when you're conducting oversight of federal agencies. Uh, and so oftentimes the, the give and take that you have with, with private companies is a little bit more um, professional and a little bit more um, uh, akin to civil litigation. Um, uh, my name is Keith Osbrook, and I used to work on the committee here. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, two questions. Well, one question, two parts to it. Uh, one so is that the, to the extent that, <laughs> to the extent that um, these are not the kind of questions members should ask at hearings where they go, I've got three questions, one with two parts. <laughs> to the extent that uh, uh, there are limited legal tools in this, um, uh, and, and then these alternatives have developed, like deliberative process and pre-decision and all that stuff. Um, isn't that all sort of in the service of one side or the other trying to appear reasonable? That the, the executive branch has you know, reasonable objections to this because you know, they don't want every you know, chain of mind or chain of heart to be disclosed. Uh, and that the, you know, then the committee, I think, does itself a great service when it, it is behaving reasonably, that, that, it, that it appears to be reasonable. And the second part of the question is, um, to what extent should the committee allow the Democrats uh, to uh, uh, immolate themselves uh, on a mutual? Yeah, the ability to look reasonable is at the heart of the accommodations process. Um, and if you cannot articulate what you're looking at and what your priorities are, and identify with some specificity 
what you need to do your work, uh, it's hard to um, it's hard to make your case. Um, one of the challenges is going to be, I think, in the new Congress is there's going to have to be a decision to focus on certain oversight projects and to let others go. Um, and that's going to be, I think, the real the real test of effectiveness um, is is can they consolidate their their interests into a couple priorities and really uh, zero in on on them. I, I hate to say it, I think reasonableness is a rapidly vanishing commodity and of, of lower lower market value. So uh, you know what political scientists say, is that Congress itself, like the country, are becoming more polarized. So reasonableness is not necessarily what your base want to see. You know, you look at the, the, the elections, right? The, you know, there's a lot of support going to the people who are the more extreme wings of their parties. So it may not be the case that the appearance of reasonableness is what you want. Your party, the party, the Democratic Party, I would think, like the Republican Party, would want to see zealots for the cause, beating the hell out of witnesses. That's what one. Um, the second thing is just something that is just living in California and being sort of uh, outside Washington, very, I guess, as far as you can get in the continental United States, is the things that break through into the media out there in California is not reasonableness, it's facts. So I actually, you know, the things that you see in these, it's just if you went to great lengths, but you get the key facts out, that's what I'm going to remember and care about are the you know, how many times has Google's locational data on all of us been released to people who shouldn't have known? It's going to be far more important to me than uh, whether senators or members of the House were mean to Sundar Pichar today. Right? That's Because that's what all the news outlets, because you'll read all these different accounts and you will focus on the facts that are in common in all the stories. And that's sort of, I think that's the message that, that sings through uh, all the way on the other end of the country. Okay, I think we have five minutes. If we could just squeeze in one last question. I know someone up front was very patient. Yes, John. Um, I was going to ask, you have, I mean, obviously some things in Gaza or whatever, and big epic issues, but obviously the Gaza war is a There's other things that are much smaller. Than that. So I was a law clerk um, in the law school for an oversight committee. I also worked with outside organizations in the foyer and things like that. How do you guys generally sort of decide, take something that you know, isn't in Gaza or something that's like huge and decide that it's worthy of Congress's attention. I mean, I've heard different people say different things. So the question is, uh, for things which are not obviously high profile, you know, sort of politically controversial subjects, how does an investigator prioritize what things to investigate and what things not to investigate? And the roles of like outside organizations. It just comes down to the relevant committee chairman uh, and their interests. Um, you know, there's some of the best oversight work is uh, bite-sized. Um, you know, something concerns you, you write a letter, have a hearing. Um, and some of our most effective um, initiatives on that front, like excessive spending at conferences, you know, we revealed that GSA was just wildly spending, um, you know, money on conferences, just throwing government, you know, taxpayer dollars down the drain. And, you know, you, you have a hearing on that and, you know, someone got indicted for for buying some extremely inappropriate items on taxpayer dollars. Um, and very quickly, all the other agencies get in line. Um, all the other agencies, you know, don't want to be the next GSA um, and don't want to have, uh, a, you know, excessive, excessive uh, spending at conferences. Um, so then another issue sort of on the other side of the aisle that we've seen in the last couple of years is um, you know, use of first-class air travel. Um, and, you know, that's a very easy thing to investigate. You know, you, you write a letter to the agencies and you ask for, um, you know, all, all documents relating to first-class air travel. And, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to say that's too broad. Um, and um, very quickly, you know, after after Secretary Price got got dinged for that very publicly, uh, the other cabinet secretaries stopped flying first class, well, at least on taxpayer dime. 
I, I just highlight something you didn't say, which is contrary to what political scientists would think. They would say, um, if you were the Democrats in the House and you want to win the presidency back, you would pick the electorally significant states you need to win and focus your oversight activities mm-hmm. on uncovering corruption in those states. Right. That, that, but that's actually not how, uh, you know, that's not how you did it, which is interesting because that would be the politically selfish way to do it rather than the national interest way <laughs> to do it. <laughs> Any con- concluding thoughts, gentlemen, or have we? Okay, very good. Well, please, let's thank our panel for their expertise today. Uh, just one final note. Amanda sent along her apologies that she got called back to the Senate. Um, and one uh, calendar item that I'd like you to, uh, uh, if, if you're available, uh, put on your calendar for February 6th. The Article 1 initiative will be holding a conference, an all-day conference. Uh, it will be the first annual legislative branch review conference. The theme will be new ambition for the first branch. And more information will be coming out soon. But thank you all for coming and have a great day.